Ancestors in the Making is a series of interviews and conversational pilgrimages into the territories of adulthood and elderhood, ritual and ceremony, initiation and rites of passage, and community and village. Throughout this intimate video series, we spend time with visionaries and healers as we journey to pick up the lost threads of earth-based wisdom and ancestral ways of living, to remember who we are at our core and how we may fully embody the soul gifts that we came into this world with. I am Aliona Kobevka. And I'm Alexandre Jodin. We're a married couple and the voices behind A Healing Bridge. We're holistic psychotherapists and facilitators who offer experiential therapies for seekers and sensitive individuals on their path of psycho-spiritual healing and development. We are lovers of the earth and the natural world and are devoted to contributing to the evolution of consciousness and reviving the nature-honoring and animist ways of living that can support us as a people to remember who we are and what we're here for. We hope that this series will bring you into a direct experience with your own soul and inspire you to keep on walking the path that is authentic to you. In today's conversation, we are speaking with Kadar S. Brown, the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council. Kadar is an internationally known ceremonialist, healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Over this time, Kader has developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his depth of clinical knowledge of experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and healing methods from around the world. Kader has apprenticed with Stephen Foster and Meredith Little from the School of Lost Borders, Maladoma Somme, an initiated shaman and elder of the Dagara tribe of Burkina Faso, and he has also had the privilege and honor to learn many valuable insights into healing from his apprenticeship with Cherokee elder and medicine person Will Rocking Bear. Today we speak with Kada about following your calling and discovering your unique medicine. Hello, Kada. Welcome to Ancestors in the Making. It's so lovely to be here with you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here as well. Yes. Um, we're really excited to have this discussion with you. And um, yeah, we're, we're super grateful uh, for this time. Um, what we'd like to do to start off uh, our conversation today is just do a short acknowledgement of country. Uh, we'd like to um, send out our respect to uh, the traditional uh, owners of the lands from which we're recording, which is the Wurundjeri uh, peoples of the Kulin Nation. And uh, we'd like to just acknowledge their, their ancestors, their elders, past, present, and emerging, and just really acknowledge the connection to country and their sacred relationship, their sovereignty, which is still yet to be ceded. And just extend that to Asheville, North Carolina, where you are, Kato, to the Cherokee peoples, who I believe are the mm -hmm. custodians there. And um, take a moment to just welcome all of our ancestors, my ancestors, Eliona's ancestors, and your ancestors, Kato, and all those that walk amongst us. Um, and we'd really like to extend gratitude for those invisible forces and beings that brought us into connection with you um, mm -hmm. not long yes. ago. So, yes. yes. And I'd like to pass it over to you to open up the space with an invocation. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, it's a honor and a privilege to, to sit with you this evening here and this morning there. And... Um, so I offer this invocation as an extension to those that you have acknowledged so far and uh, to call in the greater circle. It's my rattle here. <clears throat> so I invite all of our listeners to call up an image or send your spirit as you're sitting in your chair 
to a place in nature that you know, that you feel comfortable, that feel that uh, a place that knows your name as well. Um, so it's some place that you have seen, some place you visited, some place that you know and knows you. And as we begin this invocation, I invite you to close your eyes and imagine yourself standing in that place at sunrise. And we'll begin. <clears throat> so with much gratitude, for Creator, Great Spirit, we come to you this day with an open heart, with a clear heart, and with humble hearts. We'll call upon the medicine ancestors, those of the land there and those of the land here, and those medicine ancestors that were in service to their people, to call in those sacred energies and allies and elements. So we welcome those medicine ancestors to assist us in this calling in ceremony. And now turning toward the rising sun, feeling the warmth on our face, we greet this new morning. We'll call on the energies of springtime and new beginnings and fresh new starts. We'll call on the energy of eagle and condor and hawk and all of those high flyers that teach us how to see the big picture in our lives and how to focus on the tiny details. we we'll call upon that good medicine from the east that teaches us how to see each other for the first time every time, to drop those old stories that we have about ourselves and each other that will allow us once again to see the mystery and the beauty that is present before us all the time. We we'll call upon that good medicine of the East in the form of song and ask that this song be carried out on the wind as a blessing to all our people, all our relations. With much gratitude to those beautiful ones of the East, we welcome you here to this circle, to this virtual gathering we ask that you awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. Okay. A quarter turn to the right, we face south. We call upon the good medicine of the south, the beautiful ones of the south, the place of the warming sun. The place of action place of integrity and impeccability, the place where our thoughts and our feelings and our words and our actions are exactly the same, of courage and innocence and playfulness and passion, of coyote and rattlesnake, and all that beautiful good medicine in the South we call upon you this day. With much gratitude, we welcome you to this circle. I ask that you awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. Ashe. And we call out to the beautiful ones of the West, the place of the setting sun, cooler nights of autumn, bright colored leaves overhead and on the ground, to the healing, nourishing elements of water healing and reconciliation and forgiveness, ease and flow. Call upon the medicine of initiation and turning inward. And we thank you, guardians of the West, for teaching us how to see in the dark when that darkness is within ourselves or when that darkness is around us. To stay focused on that light, to walk towards that light. And we call upon those medicine allies of the West to join us in this circle to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. Ashe. And we call out to the good medicine of the North, place of sacred mountain, 
place of the storykeepers and the elders. Mm, the elk, and buffalo, to prayerfulness and abundance and gratitude, in the place of surrender and letting go, place of self-acceptance and self-love, letting go so deeply that spring simply shows up by itself for no other reason that we, than we let go enough. So we thank you, Sacred Mountain. We welcome you to the circle to awaken within each one of us that good medicine, that bone memory where you live as well. I hope. Reach up high to Sky Nation. Grandmother Moon and Grandfather Sun. Grandmother Moon, we thank you for teaching us how to own those shadowy places in ourselves. How to talk about those things that are often difficult to talk about. To bring those things that we hold in shadow and bring them into the light over and over and over again the way that you show us how to do. And Grandfather Son, we thank you for showing up every day and teaching us about the discipline and the integrity of falling down seven times and getting up eight, always eight. For showing up every day when it's challenging and difficult on those days. We also reach out to our star sisters and brothers and others and thank you for shining down your light upon us and reminding us too that we can shine as a beacon of light as you do by the way we live our lives so that you could see us from out there into expansiveness and mystery and endless possibility of the great above we welcome you to the circle we ask that you awaken within each one of us that bone memory, that stardust that we each carry. Ashe. Now we reach down to the earth, digging our hands into the soil, as if putting down roots. We thank you, Mother Earth, for all the good medicine that you offer for teaching us of balance and nourishment and restoration, for reminding us that scarcity is an illusion only perpetuated when we live out of balance with you. So we thank you for nudging us back into balance the way that you do. We thank you for reminding us of home and community and belonging and connection. With all the good medicine from the great below, we acknowledge you this day. We call upon you to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. That place of soil and soul that we each carry within our being. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Ashe. We reach out to those seven generations and beyond that stand behind us our ancestral lineage, to those footprints and heartbeats, tears and laughter left in the ground, left on the wind. We thank you for dreaming us into this place. And to those ancestors that stand in front of us, those seven generations and beyond that stand in front of us, we thank you for watching to see how we live our lives so that you will know what to do when you get here. We thank you for that level of accountability and trust. May we be worthy of it by the way we live our lives. To so those bright and shiny ones, those ancestors that lived well and died well and that are well in spirit, we invite you to this circle to awaken within each one of us those ancient agreements that we made with you before coming here 
about who we were coming here to be, what, we were, what medicine we were coming here to offer. Help us remember those agreements in this conversation today. Much gratitude, we welcome you. Shay. Now we call out to the spirits of the land around us, wherever you are on the planet right now, offer your gratitude in the form of awareness to those standing tall ones that may be just outside your window, to that mountain spirit that may just down the road, to the spirit of that river that may flow nearby. the plant medicine people, to the four-legged people, the two-legged people, the winged ones, the stone people, and all the beautiful beings of this land around us. We acknowledge you this day. May we vow to listen more deeply to the dreaming of the land so that we may once again hear that dreaming in our own dreams and be able to redream a new land, one of honor and respect between us. Much gratitude, we acknowledge you and we welcome you. Ashe. And to the great council that sits on the other side of the fire, tending those coals and keeping them hot, we thank you for the way that you stand by us. We thank you for believing in us, even when we stumble and fall and have a hard time believing in ourselves and each other. We thank you for keeping that fire burning over there. And may the way we tend the fire on this side be a blessing to all our relations, all our peoples, human and non-human peoples, living and non-living peoples, by the way that we live our lives. With much gratitude, we welcome you and acknowledge you. Ashe. So as you're ready, I welcome you to open your eyes and maybe reground yourself a little bit. So it puts me in a different space to come back from my invocation. Or maybe we don't come back. Maybe we'll just keep the door open and see what, see what trouble we can get into. <laughs> Thank you so much for that beautiful invocation. I have tears oh, in your eyes, welcome. so I know that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Tears are, uh, tears, they're not enough tears of acknowledgement mm -hmm. in this world. They're, they're too much tears of, of regret, um, but not enough of just deep acknowledgement and gratitude and a lot of unresolved grief floating around that gets petrified and turns into turmoil. So yeah, tears, I think tears are really good medicine. Something we could all use more of. Agreed, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So we would like to begin today by sharing a couple quotes from you. And um, one of the things that you've said um, that's really struck us is that the life that we're in may not be the one that we're headed to. The life that we're currently in may not be the one that we're headed to. And another thing that you said is you don't want to be living a life that's not your own. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, would you be able to explain or expand on those statements and also how they might relate to the topic of awakening to and following one's calling? Yeah, I think those lines come from a poem called Follow Your Name that I read a while back. And uh, if I can remember the verse, God, I'm terrible about remembering my own stuff. Um, uh, if you are not initiated into the mythology, into the bone memory of your own life, you will likely be living an existence that is not entirely your own. In the life that you came here to live, standing several paces in front of you, looking back over its shoulder with eyes wide, waiting for you to remember, 
to walk towards it. Where are you? It says, I am here. Who are you? I am this moment. Do not live your life in such a way that others give you a name that you have no belonging to. Do not live your life in such a way that others give you a name you have no belonging to. Um, it's, it's an excerpt from a poem called Follow Your Name. Maybe we can send that out to people uh, somewhere in this or after it's over. Um, and it, the poem itself uh, came to me and I'm working with a young man who was 17 and um, we were in a, I was uh, working in a wilderness uh, recovery center where we work with the kids, the teenagers out in the, out in the wilderness. And um, they usually spend about eight weeks with us. This was many years ago. Um, and it was a young man that had uh, for a time lived in, um, I think it was South Africa, in a village. And then his uh, family moved to Washington, D.C., here in the States, um, when he was eight years old. And so already you can begin to see you're moving from village life to, you know, Washington, D.C. in the United States. This is that's a huge shift of reality. Um, and as a consequence, uh, he did seek out initiations, as would have been the way of his people, but they were through gangs and violence and drinking and dangerous behaviors. And, um, and knowing something about where he was from, I said, do you have another name? And he, I remember he looked at me, kind of tilted his head and said, yeah. I said, would you be willing to tell me what it is? And he, he uh, or write it down. And he wrote down this really long, this entire across the page, pretty wrong. I said, well, you read it to me. It was in his native language. And what he said, what he read was elements and animals and features in the landscape that were in this name. And then he paused. I always get tearful when I, when I, when I see him. And this moment he paused and he looked away and he got teary and he said, you know, when I was leaving the village before I moved over here, Ma Goji, his grandmother, said, follow your name. And uh, I said, have you been doing that? And he said, no. And then I had another experience working with a, a, a young lady from the Seminole tribe down in another one of our states down in Florida, and she come and in a similar way, told me a very similar story. She too, at a very young age, by her tribal grandmother, elder, had been given a name. Um, and what I noticed that, that these names, um, is, it's uh, a tradition in many cultures, often um, First Nation peoples or indigenous peoples, where there's this understanding. Um, that you're born into this world from the realm of the ancestors. You come here with medicine to offer. Um, you come into a certain uh, ancestral lineage lines, one, to, to further the healing arc of those lines, uh, but also to be activated in a certain way to offer what medicine you came here to offer. That you would have made agreements with your ancestors before coming here about what that was going to be. And you would have formed uh, relationships with certain ancestral allies or helping spirits, we could say, in your lineage that also carry the same medicine. This is all before we arrive. And then when you arrive here, um, the, often the job of an elder is to study this child and, and discern what is the name, what is their name? They come in with this. We have to, um, was, the, the word education actually comes from the Latin root word, educare. And it doesn't mean to fill you up with information that the society you live in then will want from you. It means to draw forth from within, 
so that the role of a teacher was not to teach you things or give you information, actually was to pull stuff out of you. Your genius. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that, that the elder would see in you the qualities of, uh, uh, or a frequency of name that might be, um, that would come in the form of imagery that they would assign. They would, you know, images of landscape and animals and elementals. And um, because this was the name, not of who they were in that moment, but who they had to live into, like to live into your name. She said, follow your name. Um, so this, uh, this way of being that, that are, that these, these names, certainly these names with this type of, uh, conscious intent were meant as roadmaps, um, as opposed to simply descriptions of some quality or a naming of an ancestor without a full appreciation of what we're giving this child. Um, and so it's um, uh, this, this uh, roadmap, if you will, to follow your name. And of course, in, in many traditions, you may go through initiations where you, your name changes. You're taking on different medicine or you're activating different qualities of medicine that you carry. And now it requires a different frequency so that when somebody speaks your name, it calls out that frequency of medicine. Um, so that when you, uh, I've heard people often say, you know, I never felt like I belonged to my name, like it. And then I say, well, well, you know, and they have this other name. I say, well, what happens when you hear this name spoken? It, it, it causes something to be called out in them that they want to rise up to meet. Um, and so there's this connection between ancestors and the relationship with ancestors and, and the transition into this physical realm. Uh, and the fact that we want to deliver the medicine that we came here to deliver when we go back there. We don't want to go back there and say, whoops, I forgot. Or I got involved in all these dramas and all the stuff that I was going down there to deliver, it just, it's still here. I didn't drop it off. <laughs> um, so you want to leave all that stuff in the ground before you go. And uh, so somebody else can come along and dig it up and find it and it'll be of use to, to future generations. Um, so relationship with ancestors uh, as a, uh, a realm of um, support, a realm of relationship and, and reminder of who we are and what we carry. Um, and also to live in such a way that we can, to, that we too, as your a title of your, um, of our conversations or the conversations you're having about, um, you know, becoming ancestors, um, to become a, to live well and die well, you know, to, to be able to transition into becoming one of those bright and shiny ones means that we would have, you know, discharge the, the, the capacity of all that we had to offer while we were here. We left nothing, nothing back, held nothing back. Um, so that's, and that's a, a longer response, but those, those lines from the poem that you mentioned, that's kind of where it takes me as I think about those, where, those, where that poem originated and where, where the lines, how they came into that. This idea that um, if we don't, if we're not initiated into our own mythology, our own bone memory, um, then there's a tendency to simply adapt those uh, values that are offered and, and um, elevated in the society that we live in. I think it was Joseph Campbell said that if you ever want to know the the values of the culture, you just look around and see what the tallest buildings are, or the tallest structures. And so, you know, many, many thousands of years ago, those were the sacred places. Now they're the economic structures, business structures. These are the, the new gods. <laughs> so if, if we're not initiated into um, those, that that we carry, 
just tends to kind of adopt what's around us. All of the isms, you know, the, the uh, you know, there, all the shadows that are rising up around marginalized peoples and racism and consumerism and capital, all these isms and lookism. I mean, it has so many labels. Um, and that's kind of what's left to, to adapt. Um, the other thing about what it's speaking to um, these initiatory experiences are to connect one deeply to uh, not only the medicine they carry into their ancestors and to the delivery of that um, and into their community, um, where pseudo initiations or those that have come to replace the ancient ones tend to want to bind the individual consciousness and, and behavior to some other group agenda uh, that is in service to, well, it's mostly in service to self. <laughs> um, where to be initiated into one's own medicine is, is to bind one to those agreements, as we would say, or the um, those sacred agreements we made about what we we're coming here to offer um, in service to our people, human and non-human peoples. Um, and so it's a huge difference between um, the pseudo initiations and then what we're called to. Um, and if, if we're not, um, that, that line, if we're not initiated um, into that mythology or bone memory of who we are, then you'll likely be living an existence that's not entirely your own. And you might not ever know it mm -hmm. um, until you just maybe feel really disheartened at some point in your life or, mm -hmm. or you find yourself living a life that you don't belong in um, mm -hmm. and not sure what to do about it. Um, and uh, yeah, that, I see, that happens so much. Mm -hmm. and, and it leads to, um, you know, so much turmoil, so much, uh, there's, we have so many um, kind of uninitiated uh, people that are, that are endorsing the, the, uh, the, the false mythologies um, and asking, you know, and, and then others to follow. Mm -hmm. um, or the other side would be um, people become depressed and suicidal and anxious and um, I was uh, and working with a lot of people over the many years that when, when people are feeling suicidal and they, they'll may I'll ask them or they'll tell me uh, and I'll say you're right something needs to die but it is not you that's the confusion that there's there's a way in which you've been living that is not congruent with who you are. That's what's trying to die. And if you're not careful, you misinterpret that and think it's yourself. Um, and this is what um, these old, you know, these old ceremonies, old rituals uh, assisted people in, in, in crossing these thresholds, these great divides of challenge where, um, where we're asked to reach out to something greater than ourselves. You know, in the, that, that threshold phase of an initiatory passage um, where there's no certainty to hold on to um, and yet we reach out um, maybe only with grief or prayer or something um, but it's that kind of deep surrender um, I think that's that's really called for to you know if we if we approach uh, if we approach that which is sacred with an open heart, with a humble heart, that which is sacred will approach us. And someone there, we may experience some grace, um, but it requires that kind of approach um, for it to approach us back. So. So much of what you've shared just then, um, thank you, by the way, um, really touches 
it has touched us deeply in our journey and a lot of the people that we work with and um, our friends and community around the world, um, specifically around being disconnected from ancestry mm-hmm. and being disconnected from an intact cosmology. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious as to your perspective of the value of grief and not necessarily finding solutions to fix our life, but to simply, as you said, surrender with an open heart to um, maybe something that's happening in our process um, that isn't very flashy or popular or looks good externally, but may actually deepen our connection to uh, our own mythology, as, as you were mentioning. Um, so maybe if you could say something about grief and then also something about um, not having an intact cosmology and an, an inheritance of um, maybe someone even saying this is, you know, here is your name. Here's your original name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, this loss of connection, this loss of belonging um, is is reflected in our um, abuse of the planet for one the place of our the place of belonging you know so it, it shows up in a not just in relationship to ourselves with ourselves and each other but also in how we treat the planet um, if you can imagine let's see if I have um, I was looking uh, imagine uh, a braided sweet grass have you ever seen sweet grass that comes in a braided strip where three strands are braided together. If you can imagine that sweet braided sweet grass and one of those strands is you. Another strand is your lineage, your ancestors. And another strand is the very land from which they come. And there was a time for all of us when these three strands were not separated when who we were as individuals could not be named separately from our ancestors and that could not be talked about separately from our relationship to land, to, to around us. It's like they were just woven tight together. And, and yet over time, these things have become unraveled and there's grief and loss and that disconnection. Um, in whatever way it's, it's happened for everybody. Um, and so grief, um, I always say that grief is not an individual dilemma, it is a collective responsibility. And so we think of, of a grief ritual, if you will, or a communal, ex, a communal expression, a communal gathering of, of offering of grief around an ancestor shrine or a, um, a grief ritual, um, that this outpouring um, is, is food, is food for the spirits. Um, in my lineage, there's an old uh, Irish proverb that says that the troubles in the other world can only be healed from this world. And yet the troubles in this world can only be healed from the other world. And so in that, in that quote, it, it implies there's this reciprocal responsibility of tending and caring between the ancestors and us. Grief is the conduit. Um, grief is the, uh, the connector. You know, shared grief uh, eliminates all uh, beliefs of divisions when you're in it. Um, And so it connects. Um, So grief as uh, as our our offering of water brings connection, Um, deep connection to those uh, uh, places within ourselves that we carry, maybe from our own biographical story or maybe the parts of us that we carry ancestrally and those wounds and traumas that have come down through the line. a grief is a connecting element, if you will, um, that, that brings healing and reconciliation. 
Um, and so um, that's why I say grief is a collective responsibility. It's like um, when when people talk about loss and, and grief and they say, well, it's been so long, I still feel sad. You know, will that ever stop? And I'll say, I hope not. I hope not. When I think about my dad who died in 1992, when I feel the tears, it's like the doorway of connection is open. Um, or my mom who died just a couple years ago, when I can drop into that heart and feel the grief, it's like I feel the presence and the connection to to the love. And, and, and so that, so if we think of grief as that which connects in a world where there's so much brokenness and so much separation um, and, and so many, so much homelessness of spirit um, and, and cloaked with individualism. <laughs> and, um, and yet the, the, the gatekeepers that, that uh, interrupt one from being able to touch or open that, you know, are, are so many, you know, um, and, and yet, um, and they have to be honored too. They have to be acknowledged. And you, often it's just, well, well, we just don't do that because you say that's a good thing to do. It's like, maybe, um, you know, I've talked with many, it's like one, in one person's story, maybe this line of strong women who became very stoic, um, was necessary to get through that famine or that Holocaust. And, and thank God that they were able to do that. Um, and it's okay now. Um, and so grief is a way to connect um, and heal our lineage. Um, when we talk about doing ancestral line clearing healing work, uh, we're talking about um, an invocation to the to the ancestors in our line that lived well and die well, those that are well in spirit, to assist us in healing that which is broken and disconnected, those traumas of uh, that live in the line between where they are and, and where I am. Um, often those are uh, done with water, not only our water, but in water or with rivers and close to rivers and that's where two, two, two rivers come together. Um, rituals of, of healing, uh, ancestral grief. Um, so it's, um, so grief is a, a necessity uh, of, of healing and um, connection and belonging. Without it, um, you know, the belonging gets uh, disconnect. I mean, we, we lose our sense of connection. Um, and, uh, and maybe we, as, as in the other story, maybe we maintain that for other reasons that happened hundreds of years ago. Um, but being aware of that, you know, so that um, the healing work we do isn't just for ourselves. Um, it's, it's for the ones before us and the ones that are coming after us as well. And they're both assisting us in doing it. Um, so grief is, uh, yeah, grief, grief is such a, a component of, or a conduit of connection and belonging um, when we can drop into it. And then there's uh, different kinds of grief. I would say, you know, there's your personal grief, something that you're wrestling with from your own story, that you finally say, I let go, I surrender. Uh, or whatever it is that allows the grief of, of surrender to begin to show up. Um, then there's the grief of others that because we're energetic beings, we absorb and feel. One of the greatest teacher teachings I received from uh, 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 teacher Rockingberry uh, when I was telling him a story about something I was feeling deeply. And he looked at me and he said, is that yours? And I immediately knew what he was asking. I had to kind of reorganize my, my Western mind for a minute. Um, and I thought, I said, you know, I don't, I don't think so. I thought it was, and it was causing me great pain. 
but I realize it's coming from here. And, and so we also carry each other's grief. And those that we're connected to, um, we, any healing work we do assists those we're connected to. Um, any troubles they feel, it'll be felt in the field, and we'll, we'll feel it in the field. Um, and this is true also, then there's the grief that is uh, ancestral and turns to travel through lines like a hungry ghost. Um, and then it's the grief that we have denied and buried in the land. Um, and uh, I have a, sometimes a different perspective on that when people say, well, the trees are grieving or the, the mountain is grieving. I said, no, the mountain is holding the grief that we have not acknowledged because that's what the earth does. It is our mother. It will hold us. And if we don't acknowledge it, it's going to still hold us. It's going to feel it. And until we acknowledge it, it's going to be holding that for us. Um, and so it's and so there's grief that's that's embedded in the landscape, um, and and places that have been resting there, and somebody that sensitive comes along and, and touches that stone or that that tree, and all of a sudden whew, becomes a hollow bone to to move it. Um, so the 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 the, the unacknowledged grief and and un uh, becomes petrified. Petrified grief uh, looks like anger. And uh, if you see an angry man, um, there's an old saying, uh, I think I heard this somewhere in Africa, an angry man is a man on the road to grief. And the sooner he gets there, the better for him and for us. <laughs> so let's not, let's not shy away just because he's all angry and stuff. Let's, let's go in and let's hold him because he's on the way to grief. Um, and so often that's what happens with grief. It becomes petrified anger, and then we forget that that's what's happening here. Oh, there's a lot of sadness here. Um, and we tend to pull away from it or counter it with more anger, and that just, that just creates more grief. Um, so grief is, uh, yeah, there, there are um, people I'll call, I'll call tear listeners, and these are people that have uh, consciously through, maybe not intentionally, but they have a conscious awareness of, of that simply their, their life experiences have uh, uh, conditioned them by apprenticing them to grief. They have had to, they have apprenticed themselves to grief simply by the fire of living their own life. Um, and this isn't punishment. Uh, this is uh, preparation. Um, that as these people begin to heal those places in themselves, um, their acute awareness as what I call a tear listener to sense and see and feel into unacknowledged grief in others becomes quite, quite adept and be unable to voice it, to name it, to, to draw it out so that it can, so that it can live and come out. Um, so it's another form of, of, uh, of people that carry, uh, we'll just use the name tear listening as a, um, a component of medicine. Um, and, and, uh, in my ancestral tradition, they were called the keening, often were women because they seemed to be more intuitively aware, but the keening women, they would come into situations where they'd been lost and they just begin to keen to, to sound and eventually their keening would 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 activate grief in, in the room and all of a sudden everybody would be pouring out and and um and so people also can carry um kind of this relationship with grief that they've apprenticed themselves to as, as medicine that they carry um, to to help others bring grief out um, but yeah, it's it's um, it's quite an under acknowledged and misunderstood emotion. <laughs> mm. Thank you so much, Cater. I can feel my whole being kind of relax as you. I feel that you've offered a reframe for not only us but so many of us from looking at grief in kind of a pathological lens. 
Mm -hmm. We're really seeing that there's a lot of meaning in grief. Mm -hmm. And I know in my own life and also with the people that I've had the privilege of working with that when there's that period of darkness in these initiatory portals that we move mm -hmm. through, that's usually when we can get really stuck. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, what do you see as some of the resources mm -hmm. that are important to harness, whether that's communally or individually with nature, that will help us to be able to move through the darkness, as you've called it, as the seeding ground? So this, this, uh, this passage you described, this, this, I call it the threshold, um, moving through the threshold. Uh, um, and we have to be careful with the word stuck because it implies, it's one of the, 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 the unfortunate things about the English language is it's filled with way too many of the wrong kind of words. Um, it's not a living language. It has way too many nouns and not enough verbs. <laughs> um, so when we name something stuck, um, it means that we have an agenda that we should be somewhere else and that where we are is not okay and by definition is not even a place. I used to say when I was a, 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 as a therapist early in my career, I would hear the uh, people talk about client resistance. And I figured out, oh, client resistance means therapist agenda. <laughs> because it's a place. And so it has to be um, threshold is this, when, when we come into a threshold, it means we are no longer where we were and we're not yet where we hope to be. We're in this undefined realm of uh, where there are no names, there are no, there's no ground of certainty. Um, and so stuck is the result of, of, of looking for certainty um, or the boredom of lack of stimulation um, that, that is, a, is a gatekeeper that prevents us from dropping into a, a, the present moment. And um, what really drops us into the present moment is when we have reached the, uh, the end of our own uh, limited resourcefulness in the journey and we let go. Maybe with the belief that I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if this is going to happen. I don't know what to do. It's like saying, I don't know what to do is actually the beginning mm -hmm. of dismantling uh, stuckness as an agenda to be somewhere else. And I don't know what to do is an invitation. I don't know what to do is a prayer of, of grief. It's an invitation to the sacred um, uh, of, of an open heart, of humbleness. And I say when we, when we reach that place where we can drop all pretenses that we really knew what the hell we were doing anyway, <laughs> um, and we open and say, help, I don't know what to do. I don't even know if anything's out there. And, it, and it's a, um, a cry for help, a cry, you know, in, in the... Uh, what I've learned in the Lakota tradition in this tribe, they have this word called hemblachia to describe the ceremony of a rite of passage, a vision quest. Actually, the word vision quest is not a native word. It's, they don't have that word. But they have this word hemblachia. Um, and forgive me if I'm not saying this correctly, but the beauty of the word is that it is it implies an action, meaning to cry for a vision. Um, so even in the word, it's like, that's what it is. One has to cry for a vision. Um, and, and it doesn't come through some cleverly orchestrated ritual of, of using these right, beautiful words. It comes when we're broken, when we're down in the, in the depths. Um, Michael Mead talks about these, that the initiatory experience can have two primary trajectories. Um, one of fire, um, which is we call an initiation by ascent. Um, it's like when you are impassioned, you have something moving through you that's unstoppable. You got to do, do it. It's just you are on fire. Um, 
we also might call it a genie possession. Um, and the thing about that is if you don't have the right kind of guides to help you navigate that energy, it will kill you. It's like this, it's the, the story behind the mythology of the genie coming out of the bottle. First thing it wants to do is kill you, not give, grant you wishes. <laughs> Um, the other is a trajectory that goes down into water. And going in, in stories where we go down into water, it is about um, ancestry, about soul work, about healing and reconciliation and, and um, dealing with those things that are hurtful and painful and, and, and coming to reconcile and heal and facing that grief and facing that rage and facing that fear. Um, and these are this this downward arc into into water. We say into grief, into into healing. And um, so it's this. Um, I'm down in the water, and I even forgot the question. I'm just whatever it was you asked took took us down through the water, and so. But there's a sense of that's where that's a different that's a place people would rather. And people love the the ascent. Everybody wants to be spiritual, um, but there's an old saying that those that are those that want to go to the fire end up in the water, <laughs> and those that end up that go into the water, well, they'll end up in the fire. Um, so the pathway to the fire is actually down through the water first, <laughs> um, and if we prematurely want to ascend, we will still find ourselves eventually back down in the water. <laughs> So this, um, yeah, these pathways of, of threshold, that's what it was you were, you were asking about. When we get to these places, they require a surrender. They require, um, in order to start round the wheel again, we have to, we have to, to let go. And letting go is, um, is equivalent to self-acceptance. Uh, accepting self in one story is proportional how is is proportional to my ability to surrender and let go. Um, it's the invitation to something greater than ourselves, and we could call it grace, great spirit, creator, um, the mountain, whatever it is. But it's an it's an invitation um, for grace, and it doesn't guarantee it. That's the nature of grace. Um, it doesn't guarantee something will enter. Uh, but if you think about your own life story, you can probably recall moments where you may have felt so broken, so uh, shattered by life's experiences, and you did that. You, you surrendered, you, and not a surrender of resignation, giving up, and, and depression, but really a surrender of reaching out to something greater, um, and something happened. You, it may have been a sound. I mean, I had, I've had experience where something in the room got really loud. Uh, or one time I was down at a, a pond and, and had this experience in this huge invisible boulder, because that's about as big as the splash was. It clearly was not a, um, a beaver slapping its tail. I know what that looks like. It was like, boom, into the water. It's like the, the, you're met by something, um, something that says you're not alone. Um, and then we begin to walk, uh, you know, hand in hand with that. I won't even call it a belief because it's beyond that. It, belief in, infers that there's some kind of construct of understanding. I think it's when we go beyond that, when we've gone out beyond the, the ground of our own beliefs that we're really um, in the essence of, of uh, surrendering to, to grace. Um, and it's such a, a fine thing. Um, but that's, I think, to have a full passage through the threshold, one must have that kind of experience. You can have, you can go through the threshold and not have that happen. I, you know, I, I got a lot of people through a vision quest ceremony and say, going through this doesn't guarantee that you're going to have some kind of soul encounter. Um, maybe you won't. Actually, most people don't. Um, something will happen. Um, 
But if you go to that place, um, things will happen. Um, it's in, in nature. I've, I've spent a lot, a lot of time working with people in nature and in wilderness. And what I've come to notice, these uh, phenomenal experiences where a creature from nature comes in in some kind of really not typical behavior way, <laughs> Um, what I've come to believe about that, or understand about that, is, is in, whether in ritual or with the individual, when they enter a state of, of openness and vulnerability, the other beings then recognize us as one of their own, and they come in close. I mean, easiest thing to notice if we have pets, they do that all the time. We feel sad and our dog walks over, or in a room of people and there's a uh, an animal in the room, and they'll go snuggle up next to the person who's struggling. Um, and so I've noticed it happens in the wild, um, that when we enter that state, somehow the, the, the creatures of the natural world can now see us where before we weren't visible or certainly weren't trustworthy because what they were seeing didn't quite match what they saw or what they sensed. The thing on the outside didn't match what they saw on the inside, and so they didn't trust it. Um, and so there's this way of surrender that invites uh, uh, the sacred in its many, uh, many different forms um, to, to, to recognize and come in closer. And that's that. When I say when you, when you approach uh, that which is sacred with a humble heart, that which is sacred will approach you. Um, but... Uh, it's that language beyond words, you know. Grief is a language beyond words. Thank you for that. That's a beautiful. Not something you can choreograph all by yourself, generally. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. That that whole um, mythic underpinning or understanding of you know the ascent by fire, mm -hmm. and then the de the descent uh, into mm -hmm. the underworld by water. I can really resonate and from both of our stories in a sense because of culture and not being initiated into our own mythologies our so-called first life was very much that ascent and the last let's say five six years has really been this decent and really been this um, long slow process of grief which when we look outwards doesn't really seem to be valued so much and so sometimes it can feel very much like a an individual isolated mm -hmm. process and then when we're putting our tendrils out to try and find some community where we can express that with and as you said you know um connect to grief in its original sense mm -hmm. um there's this challenge and this tension of um, feeling the need and the, that natural kind of urge to express this grief, but then also so many opposing forces um, that are both inside and outside, mm -hmm. um, different values, different ways of seeing um, life and um, the psycho-spiritual journey. And I guess... Um, an old mythic idea that uh, we've become aware of is something around um, in order for change to truly happen, um, the tension of opposites needs to be held for long enough so that something magical, something third, a third thing can then appear, right, right. which might not be a very popular thing to do. It's like, let's just get quick answers. Let's right. just go to do a ceremony or some plant medicine or something that's just going to fix my life. Right. And there's this living into that you've mentioned, which hasn't had a lot of airtime. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more to, um, to that. Yeah, there is this tendency, as you described, for, um, you know, things in the planet seem to me to have speeded up, at least since the last 61 years, They've gotten really fast. And even even text messages have a shorthand. It's like wow, that's you get really. We got emojis now to communicate complete uh, forms of thought with little faces, and um, and in this speeding up, um, 
we, we tend to see our relationship to the sacred as, as a uh, along those same lines that that's how you do it like you know we'll go to the plant medicine uh, weekend down in Peru this you know or, or to the uh, the plant medicine circle that's happening in town every other Saturday night you can go to it and yet it, it's uh, and people can have you know certainly a profound experience um, but these things were not meant to be like regular. They were meant to like, okay, now let's see if you can grow some corn with that. Um, if you've done, I say, if you if you've done all these things uh, with these plant plant medicine spirits, is your life growing any more corn than it was before, or are you just enjoying the journey <laughs> every time you go? Mm -hmm. um, and there's an old, old saying is that when you arrive somewhere, you need to have a story. Um, in the old days, uh, the, one of the oldest healing art forms that exist is stories. And when travelers would come after they were cleaned up and fed, they would gather around the fires and, and share the story. Where have you come from? What's happened? Um, and that, that's to say that the story can be years, you know. So how do you... How do you develop relationship with spirit? Well, here's a few things. Do this for 20 years, and then we'll have another chat and see where where that has taken you. Um, so this idea that um, things are rapid or faster that we need, there, there's not the, the discipline often or the um, stillness um, that is required. Um, to, to let those two points of opposites settle together, you know. Before they get here, we have words like stuck and resistant and, um, and many other pathological words that say something's wrong. So we tend to pathologize the journey um, and therefore it needs fixing uh, with medication or therapy or um, something um, so even this, this tendency to pathologize uh, these initiatory descents um, or ascents, as it were, um, and see them as, as something that is uh, somehow deficient, um, somehow that needs fixing, as opposed to how can we align ourselves with this person and help them navigate this? Because um, there's gold down at the bottom of that river, or there's shiny coins, there's, there's something down there. Um, we know that. Um, and when we forget, hopefully we'll be able to find somebody else that can remind us that, oh yeah, remember, last time you were down there. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, this, uh, this way of mythologizing experience um, so that it's not seen as something that requires fixing or um, or it's called or it's described as no place at all that's that's often um, when I guide people into some kind of experience in the present moment I'll say so what happened I say well nothing happened I say well that's impossible so let's examine nothing <laughs> you know get running Oh, well, there was that blue feather that you saw just for a second, but that was, and then there was darkness. So that's not nothing, that's everything. <laughs> that one thing, or if they say, all I saw was darkness, nothing happened. I said, whoa, this is the whole ground of possibility. Let's go back and let's sit in the darkness and not look for something, but just look. And that's, that's one of those, uh, shifts of awareness that where we learn not to look for something but we do learn to to pay attention um, my teacher Rockenberry used to say uh, he said I, I've learned not to believe in much of anything he said that way I can pay attention to everything and that our beliefs often can constrict our perception um, and that we can see what's within it. What's outside of it, we won't see. Um, or we'll call it nothing. Um, 
or we'll have to make it fit in there. Um, or another one of the teachers, Melodoma, said that he would laugh. He'd say, I notice people in this country are very interested in, in, in looking for spirit. But on the rare occasion when I have seen spirit show up physically, they go running. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite a, you don't want to find it, you just want to look for it. <laughs> so this, um, yeah, I think there there is this ability to hold the tension of opposites as you described, and because that is a place. It is not stuck. It is not in need of anything else. There there are qualities to the experience of holding the tension of opposites. What is the quality of it? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like in your bones? What color does it have? What shape does it have? Um, and begin to immerse ones in, in into the the present moment sensory felt awareness of this thing we may call nothing all of a sudden becomes everything. Um, one of the things I like to say is everything is connected to everything. Um, and, so there, and so therefore everything is a portal to everything else. And how you access it is with stillness and presence and awareness. And when you bring that to any moment, it opens and connects to everything else. Um, it's what what's meant by that old uh, I don't remember who who originated this one but the old saying God is in the details it's like can you bring your attention um, to the present moment of whatever's happening and all of a sudden it it, um, it breaks into something else mm -hmm. uh, but you have to pass the gatekeepers um, and those gatekeepers are all the names we call it like stuck or resistant or or uncomfortable or bored that's a really good one boredom um, I tell people think of boredom as a door and it's only going to open when you just lean into it long enough and eventually if you keep leaning into it it will crack open um, but don't distract yourself from it <laughs> um, so yeah it's all these beautiful ways of holding that that still point the tension of opposites as you say Mm. Yeah, and I guess just to start wrapping up, we've probably got about 15, 20 minutes. Um, in terms of like kind of bringing it back full circle, you know, we're talking about ancestors in the making. Um, and I think about both of our journeys, a lot of the people um, that we've been in community spaces with, something that is very challenging at the moment, you know, thinking about the state of the world, um, racial injustice, climate injustice, um, lots of injustice and severance. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about ancestors and thinking about ancestral lineage, um, there's a tendency um, for all of us, I know that we have experienced this, of trying to search for uh, ancestral connection in other cultures mm -hmm. and not really knowing the etiquette of um, how to be in relationship to maybe other lineages, other practices, um, possibly uh, due to not having a connection with one's own ancestry and blood lineage, which uh, again, coming back to this, this tension and um, maybe very difficult part of the journey of really looking at um, those traumas and those... Um, really ugly places that might live within our ancestry, um, mm -hmm. but potentially might have some um, value in deepening us or rooting us into something that, um, or into the people that are walking beside us that we're not aware of. And so I'm wondering if you can um, say a little something around the value of um, really doing the ancestral work. Yeah, so, um... In a, in a time where, with, in my perceptual judgment, spirituality is, um, you know, people are connecting with this deity or that deity or this, uh, this ancestral native spirit or that indigenous native spirit and teacher. And I think, you know, I think in a way it creates more grief with our own ancestors <laughs> because they're thinking, hey, you know. And I think the place to start, 
the starting place for uh, that kind of support is your own lineage. Um, if we go back to the braided sweetgrass, it may take a while. If you if you could turn and walk back down your your say your four major lines, if you chose one, and you started walking down your your mother's mother's line or your father's father's line, and you kept going back and back and back and back, you will come to a time where the sweetgrass is woven tight, where the the individual and the ancestors in the land were woven together. Um, and when they moved, they carried that connection. If they did have to, if they were nomadic, they carried that connection in relationship. Um, so it, it, it lives and exists in all of us. That's, that's the longing. That's the, the, uh, the disconnection. Um, and yet healing the brokenness, the, the divide between however far back those ones are and where we are. Um, and so uh, what we would call um, ancestral line clearing would be a way of attending to uh, each of your ancestral lines to connect with an ancestral helping spirit. Um, so I could offer um, a ritual prescription, a way of uh, that might, uh, I'll see if I can uh, give a couple of options for those that aren't able to go outside or maybe live in apartment buildings or some. Um, the first is to, to what we call journey, um, or the, what the Cherokee I've heard called dreaming. It's essentially journeying. Um, when I say imagination, think of imagination as the language of the sacred. It's how sacred communicates with us through images and the imaginal. And so it, it's not, it doesn't mean false or, or not real. It, it, think of a, imagination meaning um, language, the language of spirit. Um, so um, to uh, journey, um, to close your eyes, and if you're familiar with journeying with the drum, you can you know how to do that. Um, but simply to close your eyes and intend a journey uh, to the realm of the ancestral helping spirits. You can even imagine this is, is like going up. We would call it upper world journey. So you might uh, imagine climbing a tree or riding uh, uh, smoke from a fire or traveling up. Um, and arriving in a place that we're going to call the realm of the ancestral helping spirits. How do you know when you're there? Well, you just kind of know. You just have a sense of uh, either felt sense or a visual sense um, as you're, and again, if I just use the word imagination as the language of spirit, let your imagination guide you to this place. Um, and once you're there, if you're, say, if you're journeying to connect with a specific ancient ancestral grandmother, you would say, you were once arriving there, you would say, um, I am, and you speak your name, um, I am the daughter of or the son of, and you speak your mother's name. I am the granddaughter of or the grandson of, and you speak your grandmother's name on your mother's side. What you're doing is you're, you're identifying the lineage. I'm calling upon a relationship with an ancestral helping spirit, one that lived well and died well, one that is well in spirit at this time, For, you know, a, a, often an ancient one, um, uh, to come forward to, to, to meet me. And so, um, when you have a sense of one coming forward, this, this grandmother in this case, and you identify yourself again, your name and your lineage, um, are you my grandmother? And then actually you will get a yes. Um, and just to be sure, are you well in spirit? Are you connected to the, uh, the bright and shiny ones, those who lived well and die well, those that are well in spirit? Um, or the greater pool of ancestral love and wisdom in our family line. And you'll get a yes. Um, 
that point, um, grandmother, you know, I'm your granddaughter, I'm your grandson, um, you know, you're meeting and, and um, I wish to learn about our line. Can you teach me about the blessings of this line? What are the blessings of our line, grandmother? And then something will come across, something will be communicated in some form. What are the teachings of this line? Um, and then maybe something conveyed at that point. Um, we could say, what is, what is the medicine of this line that I carry within me? Um, and so you have that, that interaction. And you may do that same journey to that same ancestral helping grandmother, maybe two or three times. Maybe you just ask one question. Um, and after a while, you, you uh, on a later time, say the third time you go and, and, after, and you come back and journal, write these things down. And then in a later journey, you say, um, Grandmother, um, will you assist me in healing those places in our line that have been broken? The places of disconnection and trauma and um, grief and loss, and like all the places that have been unacknowledged um, turmoil and trauma. Um, and so you make the request. Um, and there may be something conveyed to you at that point. Well, usually there is. Um, and each time coming back from a journey, so you do three of these journeys, and then each time coming back and journaling. So now you've developed a relationship with this one ancestral helping grandma, this maternal grandmother. Um, now, ideally, if you're working with your ancestors, you want to do this with all four lines. Um, this is not the way I'm talking about it. Maybe different than others. I'm not talking about a linear step by step. You're going to go from mom to grandmother to great grandmother to great great grandmother. You're going to go to the realm of the ancestral helping spirits. You're not to engage in any of the turmoil that may live in the line. <laughs> um, if you suspect that you somehow have stumbled into the wrong room <laughs> and um, and they're not well in spirit, they're not connected to the deeper pool of love and wisdom in your family line, then you just say, thank you, I'm, I'm moving on. And you keep, you know, you journey till you find one that is. Um, that's why I usually take people to the realm of the ancestral helping allies. You just go there directly. So you have this relationship. Ideally, you could um, do this with, uh, ideally, you do it with all four lines. So you have, you've established relationship with your ancestral helping spirits. I always like to remind people that the one that shows up on that, uh, uh, let's say for you, that Wednesday morning down there, um, it's not simply the one that happened to be available and not doing anything that morning. And said, oh, let's go see what they want. I'm, I don't have anything. Do you have anything going on? No. Why don't you go to it? You're, you're not doing anything. No, it, it's the one that carries the medicine that you carry. That's why they show up. So there is not only uh, that this is the one showing up, but this is the one that carries the medicine you carry. So relationship with them is vitally important in, in moving this into the world. You know, as you journey and deepen that relationship through journey and over and over. So you could do this with all four um, over time. Um, or you could do one at a time. And then there's a, another component that I would like to call the, the ritual reenactment, where you do ritual in the physical that reenacts the relationship and the request, healing requests that happen in the non-physical. Um, and so with that healing request, often is um, the way I uh, prescribe it, is to get a, uh, an unpolished piece of rose quartz stone that represents the connection to that ancestral helping ally, this mineral rose quartz. Um, get a piece of yarn, and we'll say, um, if you're able to work with a water source, like a stream, um, say uh, 13 feet. Um, if you're in your apartment and you can get a pan of water or even in your tub, uh, maybe 13 inches. On one end, you tie the yarn to the stone, the rose quartz. If you're working with running water, um, 
let the red yarn, this piece of red yarn, go downstream. Tie the other end of the red yarn to a ring. Um, it could be a simple ring. Um, we call it your ancestor ring. Rings are about relationship too. And so your ancestor ring is relationship to your, to your helping ancestors. Um, so you tie it to the ring. Um, then again, if you're, uh, you pour, if you're using a running water source, like a small stream, you also take, um, you do your invocation in which you call upon the ancestor that you've been working with. And then you pour milk and honey over the stone so that the milk and honey runs downstream across the bloodline, the red yarn, to the ring with the healing request made of, you know, ancestors, please help me heal and clear the line of the brokenness, of the dislocation, of the things that have been forgotten. Uh, whatever you can specifically identify in that line that is needs healing. Um, and, and then you pour it over that. Um, if you're doing this in an apartment, in a closed building space, and you can get a pan of water and you're using 13 inches, then just pour it across the entire line and down to the ring. Um, the invocation is important because in the invocation at the beginning, you want to um, call upon the ancestral helping ally that you have developed relationship with through journey. Um, also have a candle present, fire is an important, um, it's like opening a doorway as you do the invocation. Um, and uh, Good to do this on the new moon night. Um, so unless you're all prepared now, you have to wait to the next one. Um, new moon being about beginnings. So you do it on a new moon night and you leave it in the water for those three dark nights. So the first of the dark nights, you do the ritual, you leave it in the water for the three dark nights. At the end of the three dark nights on the fourth day in the morning um, at sunrise, you go and retrieve the ring and the stone, and the yarn itself can be deposited in fire to be burned up, um, and then you put the ring on. Um, the stone can sit on an ancestral altar, um, or if you don't have that, even just sit it beside your bed for now. Um, and the ring goes on your finger, and then um, wear the ring until the full moon, and when the moon is full, have a celebratory meal of gratitude and thank you for the healing and thank you for the connection and the relationship and the, um, all the good medicine that's flowing to me. It's one of gratitude. It's good to cook something maybe your ancestors would have eaten or liked. Um, so you do a little research and see what kind of foods that might have been. Um, so that's a, uh, an ancestral uh, both forming relationship through the journey and then doing the ritual enactment in the physical to bring it into the physical realm, uh, the relationship and the healing request. Um, sometimes people have done all four at once, and so it takes a while to do all the journeys. And um, I'm more of an advocate of, of slower is better. Um, so, you know, on one, one new moon, do one and you will have done the journeys prior to it. So you really spend time just with this, with this particular ancestor. Um, and then uh, move to the, you know, do another one of another line. If you're adopted, they'll work it all on their end. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> you just call on um, the grandmother, ancient grandmother or grandfather um, of your lineage, of your line. Um, and then the other part is, um, let's see, uh, oh, you don't need four rings. You will have eventually four stones, each one connected to that particular ancestral ally. One ring, same ring can be used each time, so it, it reconnects, re, uh, re, the relationship re, reconnected to that line again. Um, and then ancestors, what I like to tell people about ancestors is their, you know, their, their main focus is you. Your ancestors' main concern is you. They're not concerned about world peace or how your neighbor's doing or the state of things down at the Capitol building <laughs> in this country. They're saying, how's my granddaughter? How's my grandson? What do you need? 
Um, so ancestors are, I encourage people that if you're, when you're working with helping spirits, that ancestors be the first ones that are um, deepened into before you start working in other directions. Um, to, to, to call upon those, to make those connections, those relationships first and begin those. You know, they're most helpful for the, they're the ancestors that did have a physical body. So they're really good at the things that you encounter and struggle with. Um, where other deities that may not know anything about that. You know, they, they never had a mortgage from a house. <laughs> um, so, but your ancestors had, you know, they worked, they raised kids, they did all these things. And so um, these are the ones we call them for the, 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 the things of living life and, and the challenges and struggles and you need help with this. And, you know, grandmother, you know, I need some help with this. Or, and then as you learn, uh, again, what is the blessing, the teaching or the medicine of that line? You begin to discern the different things that are moving through the lines to that ring to you. Um, and of course, anytime, if you're, if you're, uh, uh, in the healing professions, anytime you're going out into the world to work in that way, and you're calling on the ancestors, you want to put the ring on and wear it. Um, you can wear it all the time. If you take it off, leave it with the stones where the rose quartz stones are. Um, and of course in the first from new moon to full moon, wear it that entire time and keep a journal, uh, mm -hmm. nearby so you can write stuff down. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, um, a ritual prescription for both forming relationship with ancestral helping spirits, discerning clearly that you're working with the helping ones, not the ones that are troubled, and, and then a ritual enactment to bring that relationship into the physical um, and making a healing request as far as clearing the line. Beautiful, Beautiful. yes. Yeah, thank thank you. you so much for your generosity in sharing that. I know we can attest You're welcome, to that. you're welcome. Yes. So it's beautiful. I was just wanting to ask lastly, before we ask you to speak a little bit about the free gift, would you be able to share where that ritual comes from? It comes from my ancestors. They told me. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It is. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I don't remember when it came some years ago. Um, I mean, I will say I was used to working with um, an ancestor ring, not in that kind of ritual, um, but an ancestor ring um, on a divination spread um, and somewhere uh, simply extrapolated that into, um, and my understanding of when we journey to the, to the non-physical world to do work and to that um, I learned that it's important to ritualize. A ritual is a physical expression of what's been agreed upon or happened in the other world. Um, so when people say, I'm not sure what to do in ritual, I say, well, look, look over there and see what's happening because whatever's happening there is what we're gonna do here. So this way is that it happens there first. And so it's a, a physical expression of those um, or ritual enactment of the request and the prayers and the relationship and agreement made there in the non-physical to bring it here. Um, so somewhere in the, in the, the weaving together of all that information, this ritual came to me as a, in, in a divination, I don't even remember when, some, some many years ago in a divination, it just came up. Mm -hmm. um, and then it became, I realized that, um, you know, first we need relationship with these ancestors through connection and journey and then some ritual to bring it into the physical realm um, as we can begin to work with them and make requests. And then of course that could extend to create an ancestor shrine and there's lots of things to say about that. Um, but the main point I wanna make with ancestors is when it comes to working with uh, the spirit realm, um, especially anyone other than creator or all the different names we have for creator, um, your ancestors are the place, the, the perfect place, the place I recommend starting um, because it's very personal. Um, where the others, like working with the elementals, when I say when you're working with the elementals, the fire and water or mineral earth, these energies are not personal. They don't have like, they're not, 
they just are what they are and they do what they do. And it's important to know how to work with them. <laughs> they're not going to be all personal and lovey-dovey and comfortable. That's not the, the, they're just this. Now, ancestors, on the other hand, now they'll do all that. Um, so there's, you know, I just think it's a, a, it's a perfect starting place is to, to begin at home, making those connections before you start reaching out beyond into other places. And, and once you make those connections, you won't have to go searching. Um, the stuff will start coming to you because it's in the lineage. You know, you'll be called to do a fire ritual. Well, you don't know why, but it's, it's coming through. And so as you start working with it, it's like working with your ancestors becomes the, the holographic blueprint that begins to then take you in other directions. It's like the foundation that begins to direct you in other places. Um, and then you, in time you find that most of your your guidance and information is not coming from the physical world. It's coming from that, from there. Um, because you've, you've deepened into, you, you've learned how to read it, to understand it, to trust it. Um, but I think begin, beginning there, it will begin to lead other places. Uh, you may find yourself being drawn to deities you didn't even think about, but all of a sudden you discover, oh, they were in this line, way back here in this place. Um, and so it's, it's just a, um, a respectful place to start. You don't want to bypass your own ancestors and start venturing out <laughs> in the spiritual cosmos without them. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm. Thank you, Kedar. Yeah, thank you, Kedar. That was so rich. You're quite welcome. Been, been fun to spend this time with you. Yes, yes, likewise. So much so. So this might be um, an opportunity to just say a few words, share a little bit about the free gift that you'll be offering. So uh, there's a couple of free gifts. Um, you'll get a link to the website. Um, if you uh, click on the link, um, you'll uh, have an invitation to join um, and receive a audio story of Singing Stone. It's a story of the initiatory journey. It's called Singing Stone. Um, and it's a perform it using a drum. Um, it was recorded in some, uh, some, it was recorded live in some uh, weekend or something I was doing some years back. But it's a, it's an audio drumming story of Singing Stone, and it's a, uh, about the initiatory journey. Um, and you'll also will then your name will be entered into a drawing for a free divination. Um, and so out of the people that uh, register and receive the story, um, if you put in the notes um, the name of this particular. Uh, summit interview um, that will cue me to know that this is where you saw it um, and I will gather those names I usually start gathering um, the day the marketing starts happening um, and then usually about a week after it has been aired so I'll give a, uh, a good week following the the air the the airing of the recording um, to gather all the names um, and then from those names, I actually journey to my ancestors and ask them for a number. And they give me a number, and then I just go down the list till I come to that number <laughs> um, and just count. And when I come to that number, I say, this is one. And I, then, I, then I will email you and offer you a free divination. And there will also be a link that uh, you can go to to read about, you know, what it means to receive the divination and what does, what does it look like and that kind of thing. It will be a it will be a recorded session, so you get the recording following the divination. You'll get a recording of it. Um, so that's the gift. Fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you for Thank your you. generosity. And speaking of names, um, we were thinking maybe we could close with you um, speaking the "Follow Your Name" poem that you wrote. Oh, you've got, I'm on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> we might have it too i don't know Let's yeah, see. yeah yeah we do um, we i put my glasses on okay uh, as they like to say um talk amongst yourselves for just a moment <laughs> <laughs> a couple of 
shifts here with my computer poems. There they are. Okay. Uh, follow your name. And um, also, if you, I tell you what, if you put uh, either the title of the talk or follow your name into the mm -hmm. uh, when you do the invitation, I'll send you the poem too. Yeah. Beautiful. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay. So uh, again, it's called "Follow Your Name." Pay attention. Pay attention. Be careful not to distract yourself from yourself by focusing on the obstacles in your life. Focus on the delivery of your medicine, not on the stories in your head where you recount your limitations and losses. Do not indulge in such self-importance as a way to avoid taking responsibility for your medicine and the gifts of healing that you came into this world to offer. You are the heroes and the heroines of your own story. And if you are not initiated into the bone memory, into the mythology, of your own life, you will likely be living an existence that is not entirely your own. And the life you know you must live is the one standing just a few paces in front of you, looking back over its shoulder with eyes wide waiting for you to remember. Apprentice yourself to yourself. Walk to the horizon of your own dreams, the place where you live in the absence of story the place where the sharp edges of this unfolding moment demands your full attention. Where are you? I am here, you say. Who are you? I am this moment, you reply. Pay attention, pay attention. Do not walk in the world in such a way that another gives you a name that you have no belonging to. Pay attention, pay attention. Do not walk in the world in such a way that others give you a name you have no belonging to. A small task. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, well, thank you so note, much. Yes, yeah. so much gratitude for you, Kadar, for mm this beautiful connection and for your service and love. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, thank you for the invitation. It's been a joy and look forward to hearing from the, from all the folks and maybe I'll get down there sometime. We'll do one of these grief rituals. Yes. Mm. Yes. yes. Sounds great. Okay. okay. All right. Go well, everybody.